Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Profitable Musician Show podcast. Uh, My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with Abel James. We're going to be talking about musicians and health. And I know this is the Profitable Musician Show, right? You're wondering, what does this have to do with making money? It has everything to do with making money, you guys. Because if you don't have your health, you are not able to go out and make money. You are not able to make music. Whether you're an instrumentalist or a vocalist, really your body is your instrument and you are not able to operate as a musician without having a healthy body. And I know this is a a subject near and dear to me because I have had an autoimmune disease for 25 years now, almost 25 years now. Um, And it's something I've had to navigate, you know, as a musician. So uh, we're going to jump into all of this and giving you some health tips and how you can be more healthy on tour and all of that. But first, I would love for Abel to just tell his story, talk about uh, his life as a musician, how he got into health. And he, you know, maybe mentioned a little bit about his podcast, his experience uh, coaching other people in health, and how that all relates to you as a musician. So uh, go ahead, Abel. I'm I'm interested to hear your story as well. Right on. Well, firstly, Bree, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so it's it's always tough to like squish your story down to a few yeah. minutes, but, but let's see what happens. So and I you guess- don't have to. Like it's always so interesting to hear people's stories. I think so. Don't feel like you have to like give us the elevator pitch. Of course. Yeah. I I think my first real touch point with music was I was just a little kid, you know, probably seven, eight, nine years old when I didn't really know who I was. I was a shy kid, kind of a bookworm, wasn't really into sports when I was really young, kind of pre-puberty years. And so I didn't, I liked having fun and I liked goofing off, but it wasn't until I started goofing around with the clarinet that something seemed to happen there was just i liked the way that it felt in my chest i liked the weird sounds that it made and within the first few weeks of squeaking and the horrible sounds that come out when anyone's learning an instrument there was there was kind of something that happened where it started to feel right and over the course of the next couple years um i got set up with a teacher or two and later switched to saxophone and started playing out pretty much right away. One of my music teachers also played guitar. So he would kind of shop me around as the eight year old wearing a bow tie and suspenders. We'd play at local diners and, you know, I'd I'd go out busking during the Christmas season. I'd put on a little Christmas hat and dress up like an elf or something and play clarinet and saxophone Christmas tunes. And that was the first time that, you know, I, I saw the joy on people's faces from something that I was doing, like the performance that, that I was able to put on for them, whether it was family or just busking around. And so later on, I did get very much into health and sports and uh, never at like an elite level, but um, I was doing cross country running. I played football, basketball, and all the rest of those things. Ultimately went to college and went more in the music direction while I was there. And uh, music was something that once, once it hit me, I never stopped. And it was really my first career. And this is back in the late 90s. There actually was an online music scene back then. And there was a a website called mp3.com. Oh, my gosh. I was totally on there. I I bet you were. Yeah. Like, (laughs) and it was a wonderful site back then. I remember it was it it out earned my summer jobs for many years there because the streaming setup back I, then. Me was, too. We had a Christmas song that actually got on their like Christmas compilation and we were making like thousands a month. Exactly. Yeah. And I kind of had the same deal and the music wasn't top notch and even the uh-uh. bit rates were left a lot to be desired, but you could also sell songs or albums one at a time. And so that was actually working really, really well until mp3.com 
got bought out by CNET, I think. And then the whole Y2K tech bubble thing deflated. And that night that or that kind of website never really seemed to come back. But I kept playing music. Um, I was the director of a, a vocal group in college and sang and toured around for about four years, played in a bunch of bands. And also, instead of getting a work study program in college, was playing gigs nonstop. And that kind of continued until I burned myself the heck out by the time I was in my mid-20s. I was doing 200, 250 shows a year, sometimes, you know, three or four in a day. And I was doing anything, you know, it was, it was weddings, private parties, roof deck parties, uh, most of it in Austin, Texas, but also touring around a little bit as well, playing the saxophone, guitar and singing. And uh, at some point, I just had kind of had enough. There were a couple of projects that went sideways and like backstabbing amongst band members and that sort of thing. And I'm just like, oh, I'm out. Oh, and, been there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That we all have been there at some point, right? But it was around that same time that I uh, I came home one night and I lost everything in, in an apartment fire. I had just moved to Austin, Texas, you know, loaded everything into a small U-Haul in my car and just totally obliterated all of my instruments, my saxophones, my guitars, oh my. the keyboard, all of the music that I was working on. I had it backed up on three hard drives. It was before the cloud, though. And my health was also suffering because I was kind of burning the candle at both ends. And so I was overweight, kind of felt middle aged, even though I was in my early to mid 20s. And I, I had to kind of reconcile my life with itself in the absence of stuff. And I, I looked at myself in the mirror and I'm just like, this isn't working. <laughs> like, let's, let's try something a little bit different here. And so I really threw my weight at the world of health and I tried not to be so afraid of dietary fat, cholesterol, saturated fat. Um, following my doctor's advice, I had been carb loading because I was still running a lot. And so I was really hitting um, a lot of foods that didn't necessarily taste good or that I wanted to eat, but I was doing it so well that it made me sicker faster than all my friends oh. and compadres in the music scene. So I switched gears. And at around the same time, once uh, I had great results by doing kind of the opposite of what my doctor told me back then, I decided to start up a podcast because it was kind of a new thing. And having a whole bunch of microphones and recording equipment and knowing how to turn the dials to some degree and build websites by virtue of being a musician for all the years before that, I'm like, yeah, I could I could do a podcast. And, and I decided to do it around the world of health, because that's something like you mentioned, if, if you don't have your health, you, you can't perform, especially as a musician. It's your instrument if you're a singer. And even if you're not a singer, your, your body and how you feel is so important to the level of your performance and production. So building it around health was something where I figured I could always be at least somewhat interested in that as a hobby. And it became much more than that. So now, uh, 11 plus years later, we've got more than 500 episodes coming up on 100 million downloads. And secretly, I kind of like found a way to get my music out there with the podcast itself. Sometimes I'll throw a song at the end of the show or all of the intro music I've done myself and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a, a strange thing that got a lot bigger than I was expecting. But it was a nice transfer of energy away from burning myself out and kind of working too hard and ultimately playing a lot of gigs that I didn't want to into something that's that's more producing on our own terms. Yeah, totally. So this was, did you say 11 years ago? So 2012? Yeah, I actually started in 2011, but it started Pretty early. Yeah. So I started out with online radio. Remember when that was a thing? Oh, yeah. And that was kind of like my next foray after mp3.com online radio. And then I transitioned it into a podcast in 2014, which was, you know, pretty early still, but like you were in 2012. That's, that's like the early days. Yeah, it wasn't easy. There were a lot of hoops to jump through. Like there weren't even popular hosts for hosting your website files and podcast files. So it was from a technical standpoint, it was ugly. And the Actually, the way that I found out that my podcast got a lot of traction at the beginning was I got a bill from Amazon AWS. It's normally like $12 or whatever for hosting back then. And it was like $248. Oh and I'm like, oh no, like what happened here? I hadn't monetized it or anything because it was just kind of this, this hobbyist thing at first. And I wasn't taking it all that seriously. But once that started happening, I'm like, oh, maybe there's something here. Wow. So you were hosting it on Amazon. Wow. Interesting. I mean, I remember when I started, I used Libsyn, you know, there was things like Podbean and stuff, but they were very, you know, not very um, 
elegant, put it that way. Now we have all, you know, the the Zen casters and the Riversides and all the places that, you know, you can do your podcast and it's so easy and turnkey. <laughs> Come a long way. Yeah. That's awesome. So obviously, once you did your podcast, then you started getting some traction in the health world. I know that you were on, well, yeah, first you have a book, you were on a show, you want to tell them a little bit about that, just so they kind of know your credentials in the health world. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the blogosphere came first, and then there was podcasting. So I started writing first and kind of created a, a small manual, which became a book. And I started working with people one-on-one, um, -on -one, but mostly coach. I was running marathons and I was coaching other people how to run as well. And that kind of like transferred into the health thing. And then ultimately, yes, I wrote a book called The Wild Diet, which um, did really well, but it's more written in a narrative form. And it's about some of my touch points with friends in the Tim McGraw band and other musicians and how they really embraced health. This is back in 2013, 2014. And uh, it's got some recipes in it as well. So people kind of picked up on that and the podcast and they uh, selected me to be uh, an <laughs> air quotes expert on a ABC reality competition fitness TV show that was kind of like the biggest loser. It was like ABC's version of that, but a little bit more positive. And so that really got out to a lot of people. And it was an incredible experience, but also harrowing because they line you up for character assassination on day one, especially with shows like that. And so thankfully, we were able to, um, I was coaching one man named Kurt Morgan, 47 years old, and he was 352 pounds at the beginning of the competition. And ultimately, we got him down 87 pounds in less than four months. He dropped 22 percentage points of body weight. We uh, had him run a half marathon. He was able to go rock climbing after that and do all these incredible things. So after people saw that, then there was a huge swell of attention um, on the health side of things. At the same time, I was recording an album in Nashville with a bunch of guys um, who were kind of in that same country roots rock music scene. And so it was interesting having those both pro projects kind of go out around the same time. Um, and then ever since then, there have been a whole bunch of different documentaries that have come along, obviously many, many podcasts to guest on when you have your own podcast, as I'm sure you know, Brie, it's, it's nice to be able to cross pollinate with other people who are creating content, whether it's in your niche or not, you know, I've been on a lot of business podcasts, music podcasts, it doesn't have to be around health. It's and and one of the great benefits I think of having a podcast uh, is that you can start the conversation, whether it's based in, in a particular niche or not, you can start a conversation and it can kind of go anywhere. We've seen that, especially in recent years with the popularity of like the Joe Rogan show and a few other ones where it's just a giant hang for four hours where they talk about anything. And no matter what kind of show you have, you can have some of that in your own work as well. But uh, I, I've always tried to make my show a little more snappy and to the point, uh, as opposed to something where you're just setting up microphones and hanging out with people. That can totally work too, but it's all about finding your own style and what feels right uh, for you. But I'm really grateful for the traction that's come from these various projects. And most of them kind of <laughs> surprise me when they come along. So it's nice to, you have to maintain a little bit of space um, in your schedule or in your energy for that next thing that's coming along. Uh, so that you can jump on that opportunity when it pops up. Yeah, totally. And and I agree, like with podcasts, sometimes you're in a mood for one thing and sometimes you're in a mood for another thing. Like I know I follow certain shows and sometimes I just really want to learn something and get some information. And that's, you know, mostly what this show is about, I'd say. But sometimes I just want to like hear people have an interesting conversation about, you know, what happened in their week and how that relates to the subject they're talking about. And thing is like an hour and a half long. And I just put it on while I'm getting ready in the morning or something, you know, so I think yeah. there's a place for both. For sure. One, one thing I'd like to offer to the musicians who are listening, though, is um, I remember when when the podcast first took off, when I first launched it, people are just like, he came out of nowhere. How is he so good at like podcasting all of a sudden? That's not how I felt, by the way. <laughs> it's because I was just doing, you know, like over 200 shows a year for many, many years with with more than a thousand or 2000 shows under my belt in the 10 or 15 years before I ever started a podcast that made it feel pretty natural to 
to stand or sit, talk into a microphone, have a conversation and try to be entertaining and, and engaging and also understanding the timing of how all of that works. Really, that stuff came from you, music and, and performing on stage. It didn't come from practicing podcasting, if that makes sense. So a lot of people have an edge that they might not be aware of. Yeah, no, it's totally true. I mean, uh, you know, there's that learning curve of being on stage and having stage banter and stage presence and a stage persona and knowing what stories to tell when and, you know, if something pops into your head, is it a good time for you to say it or not? That kind of thing. And that is honed on stage. And I would say the same thing for myself. You know, it wasn't a big leap to do podcasting. Now, of course, my first few shows, I was like, you know, a little bit paralyzed, a little bit nervous, all those things, right? Because it's a different medium. But, you know, as you said, like for any musicians out there that have thought, hmm, I wonder if I could start a podcast, like you probably do already have a lot of those talents. Definitely. Yeah. And and of course, there is a learning curve still, even with new workflows, every time there's a software update mm -hmm. or, or something goes sideways, it's, it's hard not to be flustered. <laughs> but the learning curve for someone who's comfortable on stage is going to be a lot shorter and more compressed than people who are totally green and trying to start a podcast because that can be pretty painful to listen to or, or be involved in if you're in, if you're there for that part of the learning curve anyway, but everyone's got to go through it in their own way. For sure. Well, let's go back to the the health as far as when you said, I decided to do the absolute opposite of what my doctor said. First of all, what gave you the guts to do that? Uh, most <laughs> people are like, doctors know everything. I don't know anything. I must be doing it wrong or whatever. I must just need to do it harder or whatever. What made you think to do that? And what was that exactly? Like what kind of diet did you did you adopt then? Well, gratefully, we've come a long way in the last 10 or 15 years where um, back then, especially uh, doctors, fitness magazines, running coaches were very much uh, encouraging everyone for the sake of health to give up um, red meat, specifically butter, saturated fat, dietary cholesterol, eggs, uh, and all sorts of other things that are wonderfully delicious. And it turns out actually not that bad for us. And so giving up those types of foods, you have to eat something else. And so for me, uh, I was trying to eat very, very low fat, and that meant a lot of kind of cardboard tasting carbs. And, and, and eating that way was something where it didn't work with my body pretty much as soon as I started eating that way. Because I, I wasn't that intentional as a teen. I was trying to be healthy and, and not eat too much junk food, but I didn't really know what that meant. So I was just trying to follow my doctor's advice when I went in there. You know, they're just like, okay, your family has a history of high blood pressure and high triglycerides and potential heart disease. So in order to avoid these sorts of conditions, then it's important that you eat this way and you keep exercising like you are. So after following that advice and drinking my orange juice and eating my low fat cereal and with low fat milk and all the rest of it every morning, and also, you know, really giving up sugar and trying to kick out pretty much all the junk foods. I've always been somewhat of a health nut. Over the next like 18 months, I put on 30 plus pounds, my triglycerides shot straight to the moon, my blood sugar was getting worse, my blood pressure was getting worse, all my labs were getting worse. And so that's pretty much when when the fire happened. And I, I was moving around the same time. Uh, and so I, I had to look for a new doctor anyway. And I'm just like, well, if this isn't working, by me trying so hard, then maybe I shouldn't be so afraid of eating a steak here and there or, or bringing back a breakfast omelet instead of <laughs> eating cereal all the time. And also, uh, it completely changed the way that my hunger was regulated. Uh, so previous to that, I was always hungry every two or three hours, and I was just zapped and out of energy if I wasn't constantly fueling. When I started experimenting with intermittent fasting and pushing breakfast out until lunch, so just not eating in the mornings, a lot of people said that that was a horrible idea. For me, it started working really well. I started hitting personal bests and marathon running, sprint running, and other events I was doing, um, eating something more like two meals a day instead of six or eight meals throughout the day seemed to work a lot better. And my brain and energy started working a lot better. Everything seemed like it was firing on all cylinders again instead of being a slog. And so I, I have a lot of respect for doctors and have had many, many on my podcast. And there are a lot of good doctors out there, especially now. There, there are many who have a better understanding about 
physiology, how the body works, and also how you can incorporate things that sound zany, like ketogenic cyclic dieting and intermittent fasting, and uh, sometimes going high fat, sometimes going lower fat, or or carb cycling, calorie cycling, all these various things. Now it seems like a lot of uh, physicians, doctors, and especially alternative practitioners are totally into it. It's become almost par for the course in a lot of circles. So it's important that people understand that everyone has their own health journey. And sometimes we put people up on a pedestal uh, and it's not always the right person. So it's really important to have the right sort of doctor or the right sort of coach that works with your goals. And you have to be honest and kind of do that audit of your own results and be like, is this working? Am I number one? Am I doing this right? You know, am I following the right dogma or the the right steps? Um, and number two, is it actually working for me in my own life or not? And I, I think seeing it not work on me so hard and losing everything in the fire at the same time, kind of having that existential crisis, was enough for me to be like, all right, I'm just going to go really hard in the other direction. And the results came so quickly that it was pretty easy to keep going in that direction, especially because I was so into running. And if, if that made me feel better and run faster, I was, I was certainly willing to try. Yeah, absolutely. And, and full disclosure, I mean, I have you, I had you on the show because I've had success with like low carb keto, whatever you want to call it. Um, in the past six months, I've lost 23 pounds and I really started doing it for the benefits for my autoimmune disease. Yes, And it really has helped a lot. Um, but so I wanted to ask, you know, do you feel like there is like one way or one diet that's like a good for everyone? Or do you feel like it's just, you need to see what works with your body, your, you know, personal issues, et cetera. Because for me, I think I was probably, um, you know, my metabolism was just totally messed up because I was just never able to like lose weight and keep it off for long. And, and now, you know, that's just, it's happening so much easier. So I'm just curious, you know, how, how you think this works with like the population in general, how, how do we figure out what is the right way for us to go? It's such a great question. And it's always going to be a little bit different, but the way that I see it is that there are fundamental principles. It's kind of like music. And I talk about music a lot in my podcast, because I see health and music is, is very similar mm. where, you know, Everyone plays their own style of music, but there's still a scale behind that. There's math, right? There's solfeggio and the way that harmonics stack on each other are kind of a natural law that, yeah, you can violate it, but even people who are non-trained musicians will think that it sounds out of tune or it sounds <laughs> not quite right. And so it's similar with health where there are these fundamental pillars and we need to make sure that we're not deficient in certain minerals and vitamins and nutrients. And we also need to make sure that we're not having an excess of things that our body isn't well designed to, uh, to digest or to, to use. And so a lot of the problems that we see in the modern world with people's health come from the fact that we're eating all of these newfangled substances in huge amounts. So industrial seed oils, um, looking at kind of man-made fats as opposed to the ones that we might find in the natural world ones that have really been ultra processed same thing with with flowers um eating unhealthy animals from an unhealthy system that have been pumped full of antibiotics and hormones all of this stuff has downstream effects on our own health and so if we're talking about young kids or pregnant women they're going to be eating very differently than someone who's like a young man going out and doing marathon running, for example, like it's going to show up differently, but the, the principles are, are quite similar where you want to make sure that you are getting enough protein, enough of the right kind of fats such that your body can create hormones from them it, because these are kind of the building blocks. Food ultimately becomes electrons in your body. It's, it's an electric type experience. And so if you're fueling in a suboptimal way, then uh, your body will start to misbehave physiologically speaking. So it could be putting on extra weight, which is just kind of similar to sequestering food that you can't digest. Um, and depending on what you're eating, some foods you burn, others you store. And the ones that you can digest more easily um, or that your body is better built to digest from the natural world, you don't run into as many problems. So 
for me and, and a lot of the people who I've worked with, the thyroid underperforming can have, there are dietary factors that influence autoimmune conditions and uh, different organs of our bodies. So this is all a long way of saying, if you're satisfying the needs of your body and getting enough protein and the right kinds of quality fats, then your body can use cholesterol and other molecules and hormones and all the rest of that to create the materials that your body needs to run on. But if you're constantly fueling on the wrong kind of, of foods, then all of a sudden things start breaking down. And, and for a lot of people, we're seeing that happen earlier and earlier in their lives. So yes, there's, there are definitely principles. And one that I hold very dear is eat more like our grandparents or great grandparents did nice and simple, fresh foods, quality meats, plenty of vegetables, and try to stay away from things that are starchy, floury, uh, or sugary. And if you follow those principles, most of the time that not that you can never have cheesecake or cookies, again, we're big fans of making our own homemade treats. But if if you make them with high quality ingredients, and it's not getting most of the uh, caloric load from sugar, or most of the sweetness from sugar, there are other ways of going around it, then your body kind of shifts gears, you go from being a sugar burner, who's addicted to this high octane, super processed fuel, to someone who's more like a fat burner who can go longer without food. Usually you fill up more quickly, because you're getting adequate protein and fat. And in the absence of that, it's very, very easy to overeat the wrong foods because your body is actually screaming for protein or saturated fat or some other kind of nutrient. And you're not going to get that from all the, the boxes and the prepackaged bars at the grocery store. You get that from the outside aisles, the real food that we've been eating for generations. Yeah. I mean, I think no matter what the way you, you skew as far as whether you want more vegetables, more meat, whatever, I think that's a universal principle, in my opinion, is that we should eat whole foods. Yes. I know that like for me, I think after my first baby, a few years after my first baby, like I had that extra weight and all that, you know, and I was like, oh, I'll just eat slim fast bars, you know, right. that was, and I think that is what just what threw my ulcerative colitis into a tailspin. And then I ended up in the hospital about six months later because I was just, you know, bombarding my system with all of these chemicals and things that it couldn't digest and you know, so I definitely agree in, in the whole food department, for sure, like we should all be eating whole, real foods, like you said, from the outside aisles of the grocery store. Now I know, I know that uh, some people that are listening may be thinking, uh, I'm a musician, I hardly, I don't make enough money, even hardly to pay my rent, like, you know, all I can afford is these highly processed things that are cheaper in the grocery store. Or number two, I'm so busy, I'm doing gigs all the time, uh, I can only just grab a bar or a something, you know, what do you say to them? How can they do this whole food lifestyle when they're on the road or on a low budget? <laughs> it's so it's funny, I'll use an example from the TV show where I was coaching Kurt that I referenced before. So once again, he lost 87 pounds in like three and a half months. We had pretty much every single day, 12 to 14 hours filming on set. So we didn't really have a chance to go shopping or, or go out to meals or certainly go forage out in the forest for wild berries or anything mm. like that. And what they had um, for food for the most for the most part, and this is very consistent amongst TV shows, even the big ones, is they they have M and M's. You know, they've got animal crackers and they've got cheez its and potato chips and things like that. The the worst kinds of food that you could possibly imagine. Wait, this is a weight loss show. Exactly. Yes. So that was part of the torture, I think, was <laughs> having, you know, the camera guys are all just like slamming M&Ms and eating Starburst and stuff. And and the people who are on the show are just like their eyes are like saucers and freaking out because this is it. it <laughs> it's part of the challenge for everyone. But I also I've, like I've, putting crack of, in front of a crack addict. That is not cool. I know it's totally not cool. <laughs> just dangling carrots the whole time. But having coached a lot of musicians who who go on tour over the years, this is always a problem. And it's the answer is you have to plan for it in one way or another. So you can always use an excuse that healthy food is expensive. But 
Um, unhealthy food is also expensive. If you find that you're eating out a lot, then one thing that you can do is go to a grocery store. I do this all the time when we're traveling. Um, go to a grocery store and try to get the raw materials to build a solid meal for the next few days. Whether you have a place that you're staying, that's that's a house or a hotel, you can always find a way around eating out from some terrible hamburger joint or something like that. There, there are always alternatives. They're not always expensive either. So b- before you go out on a trip or on tour or whatever it is, um, making sure that you're going to either bring with you foods that that serve your purpose or you can source them there is super important. And the only way you can really do that is by planning ahead, like putting all the brown M&Ms in a bowl or something like that. Like have it in your rider. I, I need steaks ready for me after I perform my show, whatever it is. Um, but a lot of catering, if you are doing shows like that and, and uh, you have the option, usually you can finagle away to get some quality meats in there and it's not too hard to ask people for a salad. So uh, in terms of travel friendly foods, having something like hard boiled eggs, trail mix made with quality nuts and and not fried in some terrible oil and covered with sugar or whatever, but just like, you know, real food snacks, bring those with you, put them into your um, carry on luggage or whatever it is. We've been doing this for many years. There are There are so many different ways to do it. I'm not against protein bars and protein powders and and supplements and that sort of thing. They definitely have their place. Um, But a lot of these more expensive ways of going about it can make life more convenient, but they're totally not necessary. If you don't have a lot of money to spend on food, go get a dozen eggs, the cheap kind. It doesn't even have to be pasture raised or whatever. whatever. Um, You know, get the cheaper, not not the most expensive cheese, get like a cheaper cheese, throw a little bit of that on there, get your cheese fix, get some chocolate, get a chocolate bar, like all these things, if you start sourcing them um, as individual ingredients from a grocery store, like I was saying, or ordering online, you are going to save so much compared to just eating from McDonald's even, or eating anything that you find on the road, that's fast food, takeout, eating out at restaurants, that's gonna be five, 10 times more expensive than sourcing the raw ingredients on your own. So that's what I would say, plan ahead and try to get the ingredients to do the work yourself. It's, there's a trade-off. You can spend more money and have less time involved for the more convenient healthy foods. Or if you don't have the money, then carve out a little extra time to prioritize your health. Because if you're, if you're eating foods that you know work really well for you the day before performance or on performance day, you're gonna perform better you're going to ultimately have a, a more successful career. People will notice it. You know, if, if you're uh, running a little ragged and you show up for your show, it's not probably going to be quite so great as those days when you wake up feeling like a champion because you're all fueled up and you're ready to go. So mm-hmm. you're worth it. And um, there are an endless amount of excuses. But once you rearrange your priorities and put your health and up next to the performance at the top and you, you see it as critically related uh, then it becomes a lot easier to, to push that priority up. And especially as the years tick by and we realize that things go wrong and our bodies start falling apart in various ways, you realize that this isn't something that's optional. At some point, you're forced to do it, whether you like it or not. Yeah, no, very true. And I love the grocery store tip. Uh, actually, my daughter just went on a um, an abroad semester and she was saying to me, like she got so sick of having to get prepackaged things and and, you know, maybe fast food or something like that. So she started doing her own charcuterie boards where she would go to a grocery store and just get cheese and meat and maybe some dried fruit and just like do her own thing. Even, even though she didn't even have any, like, I'm like, how did you cut the cheese? She's like, that was a little struggle. I just like rip it off, you know, cause I didn't have any silverware. Um, but that's a way you can do that. You know, she was trains and planes and all that stuff. And so she needed something that was very mobile, So that's definitely a way to do it. And I think about when I used to tour, I did a lot of, I do like speaking as well as singing. So I did a lot of like uh, corporate events and, and, um, and like special events that were held at country clubs and they would serve just like the most like delicious food, 
but I could never eat it before I was singing because right. it would be like really rich food and stuff. And so I would always go without until after it was over and then I'd have them box it up and I'd eat it later. But it makes me think about, you know, the power of intermittent fasting and, and having a, a smaller eating window. For me, I've started now having an eating window of about eight hours if I can. And that's really been helping me as well. So I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that, um, how maybe just shortening their eating window can help because you can kind of time it around your your gigs. And I guess my one concern, because I never did this when I was touring, is, you know, if you don't, if you fast and you've got a gig that's like at noon, it's like a luncheon or something, you know, will you be at peak performance if you haven't eaten since seven o'clock the previous day? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome questions to ask because these are usually things that happen to musicians by accident. Right? Yes. <laughs> or it's just like you've had a few bad experiences where you ate that pasta creamy Alfredo oh right gosh. before you. Yeah. Need bad to go. idea. Yes. And we, we all know how that goes. I, I mean, <laughs> some people can pull that off and, and they do it. So good on them. But, um, and generally speaking, it is better for us. Um, from a health standpoint, to not eat too close to the time that we go to sleep. Like you don't want to be eating in the middle of the night all the time. But that said, for me, that's just what happens. I, um, you know, whether it's nerves getting ready for the show or having bad experiences from overeating and then trying to do a show in the past, um, for the most part, I'm always about eating super light or nothing at all before the shows. Um, I'm, I'm actually pretty similar before my big runs. I treat it in a, in a similar way because <laughs> I don't know I don't I don't want to get too into this but just like if you're hitting too much roughage before trying to run 26 miles oh, no not good work either <laughs> so or you, while you're performing on stage like that's yeah, not exactly good. You, you need to um, plan ahead for all this but what I would say is that there's a way to go about it um, that will work for you and over overeating is not good under eating isn't either. You have to find a way to check all of those boxes. And if you can build up that muscle of being able to have that eating window shifted around based upon what you're doing that day, that's really important for, for good performance. So for example, if you can put on performance, not having eaten uh, beforehand and have plenty of energy to get through your show and, and feel good about it. And then I don't know about you, but I'm not hungry immediately after it takes 30, 60, 90 minutes afterwards to kind of like calm back down after the yep. show. Adrenaline, yeah. You're famished and then you want to eat everything, right? <laughs> yes. So um, that can work if you plan ahead and and you kind of set that up. But you need to build up that muscle first. So I would encourage people on the days that you're not having a performance where you're not forced to kind of do that, try putting your eating window around that time that you're normally uh, performing. And, and kind of move it before, move it after, see what works for you. Because some people do really well by um, having their eating window. As soon as they wake up in the morning, they're eating protein, they're getting the energy for breakfast, and it's serving them for the rest of the day. But they stop eating by like mid-afternoon or even lunchtime, and then they're not eating at all that night. That can work really well. For me, usually it's, it's the opposite, where I'm pushing breakfast out until later in the day. And I would just re-emphasize that if you do that sort of thing, eating, staying up all night under blue lights, artificial lights, eating big meals in the middle of the night, uh, you can do it every once in a while, but try to make it or arrange your schedule, your performance schedule even, to, to not have that be the norm for you, if that makes sense. Like you don't want to be doing that every night because from a circadian biology perspective, the way that our bodies are naturally meant to work, at some point, that's going to be suboptimal and, and stop working so well if you're doing it too much. Every once in a while, that can work really well. But I would just encourage people out there to kind of try to perform without food sometimes. Try to practice at home. See, see how you feel. Play for two, three, four hours straight. See what your um, cardiovascular performance is like during that show. See if you run out of energy. Because playing like a four-hour show or whatever, if it's music, super similar to running a marathon in a lot of ways. It's a cardiovascular experience. And sometimes you just really need to fuel up beforehand. It depends on your show, though. It depends on how physical it is. And um, 
and even what instrument you're playing. So everyone's kind of got to find their own way. But if you aren't addicted to food and you don't have to eat every two to three hours and sacrifice the quality of your food to kind of get something in there, um, then you're going to be serving your health over the long term by not eating the suboptimal food. Yeah, I think the best tip there is really to practice this when you don't need to, you know, yeah. to to shorten your eating window when you're home and you're not on tour and get used to that. You don't want to just like try, well, I'm, I've decided I'm going to intermittent fast today for the first time, you know, when you're having a big gig. Yeah, that's called bonking. When you run out of energy, when you run out of juice in the running circles, like grown men start crying when this happens in oh, the middle gosh. of the race because your body just cannot operate anymore. We've all been there to some degree or another. So yeah, try not to get there. But maybe on the days that you're practicing this, try to get a little close to there to see what it feels like and be very in intentional and tuned in to where your body's at because that's how you're going to learn where your limits are so you can find your way back to the sweet spot. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to ask about this subject just because I know that it comes up for every musician and that's alcohol. Yeah. Right? We you you just can't really avoid being around alcohol when you're touring in some way. And I find for myself, you know, I'd love beer, but I know that it's like way too many carbs for my body. I shouldn't have it. Um, you know, so some people are like super dogmatic, like alcohol is poison. You should never have it. And then other people are like, it's totally fine in moderation, but you should have this. So I'm curious what your stance is on that. Um, as far as, you know, maybe if you feel like you want to have a little alcohol to be social, you know, what's the best to have, how often that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely a individual type experience when it comes yeah. to alcohol, but in a lot of cases, it's uh, the currency that we're paid in, or at least it's right. It's, right. As musicians, if people come up with a round of shots, you're expected to be the life of the party and slam some tequila, mm. uh, maybe two, three, four, five shots of tequila right in a row. Uh, you don't necessarily need to entertain that, though. You don't always need to say yes, just because you're expected to be the life of the party. Um, and, and we've all probably had a show or two, maybe three plus, where we've had a few too many. And we know that that is not good for the performance. It's not good. I mean, it might feel good in the moment, but if you ever see the recordings or you listen back to how that <laughs> compared to the times when you were really on point, it's usually not that pretty. Every once in a while, it's fun here and there. One thing I have noticed, though, um, as it relates to alcohol, uh, the world of food addiction is pretty similar, where a lot of people will say, I just can't have any sugar. If I have any sugar, I'm going to be going and getting the Ben and Jerry's from the corner store and bringing it home and eating the whole thing. Then there are other people who can just eat like a slice or two of cake. No problem. They're done. And, and you can have like a little bit of chocolate here and there. No problem. And, and some people just aren't built that way. One heuristic that you might be able to use to look back on your own life to see which type of person you are, whether you can moderate or whether you can be better served by abstaining. Look back to your teen years. Uh, if you were totally straight edge and you felt pretty good and you didn't really use substances up until the time that your brain finished developing, it doesn't totally finish baking until we're like 25. But if you experimented with drugs, alcohol, and, and maybe went a little hard on one of them or another during those years that your brain was still developing, it seems to me from what I've read and, and, and seen that you're more likely to be someone who will be well served by abstaining. It, it's going to be harder to moderate some of that intake of whether it's alcohol, sugar, substances, because your brain has that wiring in there where it says, this is okay, more is good. Whereas if you have lived a more straight edge life when you were younger, and then by the time you're, you're older, you can just have a glass of wine. It doesn't have that, that hold on people, maybe. It's, it's not quite the same. I, I totally get that. I mean, I was straight edge when it came to alcohol when I was younger, and I, I think I can. I'm a total uh, uh, a total moderator. Mm -hmm. But sugar, on the other hand, that was my reward system. Yeah. When I was young, you know what I mean? And like, oh, I eat my dinner, I get my dessert, I do my homework, I get my snack, all you know. And I I see that 
So I can be a moderator, but I see myself going down a slippery slope sometimes as I, I'm like convincing myself I can totally be a moderator. And then like I moderate, you know, less and less and less. So I think there's that where you can be a moderator, but you have to watch yourself if you have that programming. You've def everyone has to watch themselves, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the thing about alcohol is that you go like a few days without it and you kind of feel worse. You go a week or two and then something happens. You start to feel better around 5 p.m. or happy hour. It's like you're not reaching for it anymore. So it takes a few weeks for your body to kind of get used to that mode again. Um, but if you are used to kind of drinking at every show or you're drinking most nights, then you wake up feeling a little worse than you should pretty much every day. And by the time you run out of energy, you know, 3 to 5 p.m., somewhere around happy hour, then like having a beer or a little bit of wine, you know, you don't have that edge anymore, or, or it takes the edge off when you have mm -hmm. a little bit, and then you kind of want more. And then it happens the next day and the next day and the next day. And so that's the problem. If you're caught in this loop of trying to, you're feeling bad because of alcohol, and then you try to feel better the next day because of alcohol or using alcohol, that's a terrible hamster wheel to be on. And it gets ugly for almost everyone. So Depending on where you, you are, alcohol can be something that can work, but if there's any way that you can moderate and try to build that muscle, especially having some discipline around your shows saying, yeah, I can have a beer before my show. It's nice to kind of like hang out with the bartenders or the people during sound check and just relax for a second, take a little bit of the edge off, but just one, right? Not nine. And the same thing with, with after the show. If you can find other ways of feeling good um, or relaxing. Well, part of it too is when you go up on stage, there's just a flood of all sorts of different hormones, chemicals, neurotransmitters, and emotions. And then after, like we were talking about before that, that ramping back down when you need to go to sleep that night after a late night show, it's really hard to turn off after you've been turned on the life of the party, putting on a giant show. For most of the night and so trying to self-soothe or self-soothe or trying to kind of turn your brain off and get rid of that racing mind at the end of the night alcohol seems like it can do that but it's not really it's it's doling it in a way that you don't want there are other ways that you can ramp down after shows that don't involve alcohol that are going to help a lot more um, some of them are you know, based around food, supplements, um, or just lifestyle practices, like listening to binaural beats, putting on a meditation soundtrack, staying away from your phone and blue light after your show is done, putting on blue blocking glasses, and just being kind of practicing sleep hygiene and being clean about the way you're living has its own benefits, because you're just going to have a lot more energy and a lot more productivity. But um, Saving your alcohol for the times that are special occasions or just the weekends or something like that can work for a lot of people too. So it's tricky. I'll, I'll be the first to say it's a tricky one, especially for musicians. Um, and I do wish that there were more venues for musicians that weren't so based around alcohol. Unfortunately, that's just kind of the business model because it's hard to make that much money for the venues, which are struggling themselves. Uh, from any other substance, because they just don't have that that type of markup, except for maybe popcorn, but people aren't buying that much popcorn, and they'll buy a lot of booze. But yeah, I no. this, well, there are a lot of near beers, like zero alcohol beers, there is zero alcohol wines, and there are a whole bunch of different zero alcohol cocktails that are kind of taking off now. And I've um, had all sorts of them that I've tried, and I've been really impressed in the past few years. Uh, by how good some of them can be. Even Guinness has a zero alcohol beer. That is bomb. Really? It's really good. So play yeah. around with those if you still want your beer. <laughs> Interesting. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm one of those people that, um, that does want alcohol to relax, even yeah. though, like you said, like I do it once, it's great. I feel relaxed. It's all, but then, like you said, the more that if I do that every day after work to, you know, take the edge off, then I realize it's actually not having that effect anymore. And it's yeah, you need more and more to get that same effect over time. That's the that's the problem. Yep.
Yep. Well, let me ask you, uh, we're actually almost running out of time, but I really want to ask this question about going from a sugar burner to a fat burner, because I think this is what makes it really hard for people to, to really go, you know, take out those sugars and those flours and, and try to be a little more, um, you know, high on the protein and the, and the veggies and stuff, um, is that when you first go through that, it's difficult. (laughs) I'm personally coming off a vacation where I did eat more carbs than I usually do. My husband's actually starting a lower carb diet. And we were both talking about how, you know, it seems like when you try to do this, there's this hole, like no matter how much you eat, there's this carb shaped hole in your body that like only carbs can fill. And so you feel like even though you've just stuffed yourself with food, you still have this emptiness. How do you get past that? And, and and if anyone's heard of the keto flu, like it's a real thing. Um, yeah. But once you get past it, it's great. Yeah. So some people feel it more than others. And it's hard to know exactly who's going to feel it and when, because it can happen to the same person who just like hops back on the carb train and then tries to do some sort of ketogenic approach again. And they're just like, what, what is this hole in my belly? All of a sudden, why do I feel this way? This, this never happened before. A lot of times, some of the things at play are are electrolyte imbalance, which mm-hmm. changes depending on how many carbs are coming in. With with a lot of carbs coming in, you don't need as much salt. When you don't have those carbs coming in, you need more, more salt. So having a high quality sea salt, Himalayan salt um, can be really useful. And even if you just put a little bit of that in water, um, that's kind of the, the low tech and low expense way of going about getting some extra electrolytes in there. Supplementing with magnesium can be really helpful during those first couple of weeks as well, um, especially if you start getting cramps, like leg cramps or anything like that, which which can pop up around the same time. Usually that's related to uh, some sort of electrolyte issue. There are a lot of supplements that have gotten tastier as far as electrolyte electrolytes are concerned over the years. A couple that I like are trace minerals, where you just put a few drops. It comes in like a bottle. Um, where you put a few drops into your water and it really improves the taste. It gives you a little bit of a wide spectrum of different electrolytes. Element is another company um, where I really like the taste of what they've got in there, where it's magnesium, potassium, and sodium. So especially for the first couple of weeks, if you find that you're low on energy or you have a lot of food cravings, sometimes it's it's more of a salt craving or more of a, a craving for those electrolytes. So make sure you're drinking plenty of water and that water is is clean and pretty much unadulterated by all of the nasty things that are in tap water these days. So make sure it's it's filtered if, if you can do so. And add a little bit of electrolytes in there or add some extra quality salt to your meals. And aside from that, sometimes cycling in carbs for a few days can be really useful for people. But try to make them the clean variety, whole food variety. So I'm talking about like sweet potatoes or some overnight oats or something that's nice and clean versus just like going out and, and slamming a pizza or, or donuts. Like the hyper processed breads are the ones that really seem to affect me in a negative way. All sorts of things start going wrong if I hit the baked goods section. And I'm not sure if it's from the dough conditioners, if it's from the aluminum that they put in there or what the heck it is. But the the state of modern bread and flour is, is an ugly one for a lot of people. So yeah, the, the keto flu and eating low carb and experiencing that usually only lasts a week or two. So if you can push through it, um, then usually it goes away and it doesn't really come back in, until you start hitting the carbs again, then you try to pull them out. And if you're make, making sure that you get enough electrolytes, then you can persist. And usually if I've learned to recognize that feeling of being low on salt and, and connecting that to a craving. But for a lot of people, it's like you'll be craving Fritos or mm. just like Doritos or something that's really specific because in your brain, it's craving salt and the saltiest thing it's tasted is one of those processed foods. So before you go out and like grab a bunch of goldfish or cheese its or potato chips or something, ask yourself and try to connect those dots. Do I actually just need some salt right now? And, and a bunch of water. Because a lot of times we think that we're really hungry, but we're actually thirsty for water plus electrolytes. Mm, that's a really good tip. Yeah. And I try to be good about it, but I forget, you know, I've got to remember every day to put my electrolytes in my water and it will, it really does help. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been so informative. I love how you've been able to apply all these um, health concepts to musicians specifically. That's been great. Can you let everybody know how they can find you online? Sure. And, and thanks for having me once again. Uh, you can find me at fatburningman.com for the health and fitness related stuff. Uh, that's also the name of the podcast, Fat Burning Man. And then uh, my website for the music projects and virtual reality and other things like that and strange projects are at abeljames.com, A-B-E-L james.com. And if you'd like to check out some of my music, it's Abel James Swamp Thing is one of the, the projects that I talked about where we did it in, uh, in Nashville with a bunch of those guys. So it's, it's nice, swampy blues rock. Ooh, that's fun. Is that on Spotify? It's on Spotify, yeah. Awesome. You guys go check it out. Thank you so much, Abel. This has been really great. I really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and experience with our listeners. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 